If you have your Bible this morning, go with me to the book of Psalms, and I want you to find Psalm 119. I'll ask you to stand with me, if you will, if you don't mind. I want to read this morning out of Psalm 119. This is, as many of you know, it is the longest piece of continuous Scripture in the Bible. There are 176 verses in Psalm 119. And I'm only going to read one of them. You can holler glory right there. Now, if you don't get happy, I will read all of them. So let's rejoice now over one verse of Scripture. I want to go to the end of the psalm and I want to read the very last verse. The author pens these words. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Father, we love you today. We're thankful to be in your family. We're thankful to be in your house. And I pray this morning that as we have gathered around the Word of God, I pray that you would manifest yourself here, that you might take this Word and make it bigger than this building, make it bigger than our lives and our hearts, and may we overflow with the truth of the Scripture today. Change us, Lord. Revive us. Draw us near to you, and I'll praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We have come this morning to the last verse of the longest piece of continuous Scripture in the Bible. Psalm 119 is a very interesting passage, and I'll need an amen right here if you know this is true. They say that every verse in this psalm, with the exception of two that I have found, has a direct reference to the Word of God. In some way, every verse, with the exception of two, points directly to the Word of God. There is no doubt that the author of this psalm was in love with the Word of God. He has, with his own hand, he has penned 176 verses of Holy Ghost-inspired Bible. And he comes to the end of that psalm, and in my opinion, he ends it in such a strange way. He says, I have gone astray. Now, I'm just going to be honest. I know we don't know each other yet, but we going to. Y'all say amen. amen. I'll be honest. If I had written 176 verses of God-inspired Scripture, I would think that I would be closer to Him than I'd ever been before. I would think that the fire of God would be burning at an all-time high in my heart if I had been the instrument of God's hand for 176 verses. But he does not say, I am closer to him than I've ever been. He does not say, I love him more right now than I ever have. But in a very transparent confession, he says what most of us would not have the guts to say. He said, I have gone astray. This is a man who no doubt loves the Word of God. This is a man who no doubt has been busy about the work of God. But somewhere in the Word and in the work, by his own testimony... He has gone astray. Now, I want to say something. I need some help right here. If it's possible for the author of this psalm to be busy in the Word and the work of God and find himself astray, it's real possible. 
I said it's real possible that you and I, of all of our labor, and of all of our faithfulness, and of all of our involvement in the things of God, it is possible that we can look up and admit to ourselves that sometimes even in the work and even in the word, we go astray. I'll say to you that straying is a possibility. And I'm not talking about deep in morality. I'm not talking about, I don't believe this is a man who is off in deep, great sin. I believe this is a man who looks up from his writings and realizes he is not where he ought to be in relation to the Lord. You can teach a class and have gone astray. You can sing in the choir and have gone astray. As a matter of fact, you can preach behind this pulpit or any pulpit week in, week out and still find yourself going astray. Now, I like what he says. He says, I have gone astray, but oh, watch this next little phrase, like a lost sheep. Now, I like that for two reasons. I like it because first of all, He takes responsibility of this straying in his life. He didn't say, I've gone astray and it's the preacher's fault. He didn't say, I've gone astray because I don't have a good church to keep me encouraged. He didn't say, I've gone astray because this world we're living in is just too hard to stay right. But rather, he owns this situation and he takes personal responsibility. I need somebody to help me right here. When you get away from God, whether you are still in the church or out in the world, it's easy to point at everybody else and say, if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for that, if this was better, if that was better, I'd be on fire for God. But you must lay aside the excuses and own where you are in your walk with God. It's personal. He said, I have gone astray. This ain't nobody's fault. This is where I am because I have strayed. And he says this, I'm like a lost sheep. Now, the author of this psalm is unknown. The old commentaries would tell you that it's David. I don't know. But I do like the analogy of the sheep because here's what, hallelujah, here's what he's saying. I am not where I'm supposed to be. I have left the pasture. I have strayed from the fold, but I'm I'm still a sheep. I believe I'll back up and try that again. I'm not in the pasture. I'm not in the fold. I'm not close to the shepherd, but there's one thing I know. I am still a sheep. I still belong to him. He, hey, glory, he's still mine, and I am still his. Is there anybody here this morning that believes that when you become his child and he becomes your father, you may be a prodigal, you may go to the far country, but thank God he never kicks you out of the family. He said, I'm still a sheep and I've strayed, but I'm still one of his lambs. And the wording of that sentence leads us to believe that this was not an act of rebellion, but rather an act of carelessness. He said, I've gone astray. He didn't say I ran away. He didn't say I bolted for the brush when the shepherd wasn't looking. He said, I had just kind of fed around the edge of the field and I saw something through the holler. Holler, see, I ain't been in West Virginia a day and I'm talking y'all's like, holler. I said, holler, amen, holler. (laughs) Said, I saw something through the woods, a little green patch of grass and I went there. 
Then I saw some greener grass and I went there. And I did not intentionally try to run from the shepherd. But I have strayed and now I'm in a place where I don't know where I am. I'm not sure where he is and I don't know how to get back because I don't even know where back is. I have gone astray. How many of you can testify to this? There are some things in life we get into that we didn't mean to get into. <laughs> somebody, somebody said, yeah, right now, here, this. I know exactly what you're talking about. There are things in life that we don't necessarily sign up for, but you look around one day and you're in the middle of it. And there you are, intentional or not, there you are. Years ago, I had been preaching in South Louisiana down in Baton Rouge. And it was an all-week meeting, and I was going to fly out early the next morning. I was going to be in South Georgia, right across the Florida line. I got up that Saturday morning to catch that flight before daylight over to Jacksonville, Florida. And when I got up that morning, you just have to forgive me. I don't always look like a ministerial man of the cloth. Is that all right? I got up, I was tired, wore out. I just grabbed a pair of blue jeans that looked like they'd been run over by a lawnmower. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Old T-shirt, a hat that needed the oil changed in it. Just slapped it on my head, red-eyed, grabbed my suitcase out the door to the airport, flew into Jacksonville, and here's what I was thinking. I, I'm going to get there. I'm going to go check in the room. I'm going to lay before the Lord. Amen. Get me some sleep. I landed in Jacksonville. Two fellas picked me up that were helping with the meeting. We headed toward the conference where I was preaching. And one of them said, well, praise the Lord. We're going to make it in time for the morning service. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> what a blessing. <laughs> Wonderful. We pulled into that. It was at a big conference center. Several thousand people there. We came in the back and just sat down in the very back. There was a fellow up preaching. I like all kinds of preaching. I do. You don't have to preach like me for me to like it. I like quiet preaching, loud preaching, intellectual preaching, country preaching. I like it all if it's about Jesus. But I was tired. This little fellow's up just squeaking out in a monotone, something that he didn't act like he believed it, and we sure didn't believe it. And I was sitting on that back they had them chairs, them big cushiony chairs. And uh, his, he was just in a monotone. And, and I, I was back there clinging to life. <laughs> and he went on. I don't know. It's, y'all, y'all, you think, who has Brother John brought in for a revival? <laughs> and finally, he said them words that every Baptist has longed to hear at some point or another. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I leaned forward into that chair in front of me. And I'm telling you, when my forehead hit that cushion, the Sandman came by with a right hook and knocked me into the sweet arms of glory. I was gone. I'm talking about open mouth, drooling, gone. And all at once, that little squeaky fella who couldn't get above a monotone worked up some gumption and said, stand up. And I did. And I looked around that building and figured out real quick there were several thousand there, but there wasn't but about four of us interested in what we were standing for. (laughs) He then said, if you're standing Don't deny Jesus. You come get saved today. (laughs) Well, what are you going to do? I wasn't going to deny Jesus, I tell you that. 
wore out blue jeans, just dragging behind me. Oh, Harley Davidson T-shirt, hat in my hand. They thought, praise God, we got a show enough center coming today. Yeah, I mean, this is a, we got a real one today. I, I walked down that aisle. There was a, a young man working the altar. He said, did you come to get saved? I said, no, I just, I'm already saved. I just didn't want to deny Jesus in front of all these people. Turned around, went back to my seat. You should have seen them that night when I showed up and was the main speaker of the night service. Now, brother, that's sanctification right there. I mean, get them saved that morning and preach them that night. Hallelujah. Won't he do it, church? I mean, won't he change them? <laughs> you ever been in something you didn't mean to get into? But all of a sudden, there you are. I think that's where the author of this psalm is. I don't think he was running from God. He was writing scripture. I don't think he was rebellious against God. I think he was busy in the work of God. And just like me, and just like you, he looked up from his work and he looked up from the word and realized that he and Jesus are not nearly as close as they once were. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? I said, anybody ever been there? Amen. Have you ever been busy about what God has called you to do and looked up from your call and wondered where the one was that you was doing this for? He said, I have gone astray. I didn't mean to, but I did. And now I'm in a place where I need help. Now, I want you to notice those three words he says, can you say it with me out loud? Seek thy servant. Say that with me. Seek thy servant. This is what he is saying. He's saying, I don't know where you are. I don't know where I am. And I sure don't know how to connect the two. So instead of wandering aimlessly, I'm going to ask you to find me. Isn't it funny, if you've ever, if you've ever been lost, like, like, like literally lost, don't know where you are, trying to get somewhere. Uh, I, I was preaching down in the swamps of South Georgia. A friend of mine was supposed to be in that meeting with me. Service started, it rocked on. We got into the singers almost preaching time. He wasn't there. My phone vibrated in my pocket. I walked outside. I took the call. He said, hey, I'm lost. How many of you know what I said? Where are you? You ever felt somebody just look at the phone like, like it, it? He said, if I knew where I was, I wouldn't be lost. <laughs> Any of y'all live with some geniuses like that? I can't find my wallet. Where did you have it last? Oh, well, thank you. That's, yeah, that's, part of, that's what I, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> if I knew where I had it last, it wouldn't be lost. That's what he's saying is, I don't know where I am. And I don't know how to get to where you are. No, you can go to the Christian bookstore and I promise you, there's a whole section of books that will tell you how to get right with God. They'll tell you how to knock off that lukewarm spirit that chills over our soul. They'll tell you how to keep the fire of God burning and kindled. Everybody's got steps. Everybody's got keys. Everybody's got directions. Everybody has a formula for you when you don't know where you are. But if you've ever been really lost, you don't know where the steps, the keys, the formula, you don't know where none of that is. Amen. You sing the songs you always sing and they fall empty. And you study the Bible like you've studied it all your life, and it seems like it's just written in another language. You try to pray, and the prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling and never get through the roof. And you say along with the psalmist, I have gone astray. Seek thy servant. Seek Thy servant. I like to coon hunt. That's raccoon if you're from Michigan. Say amen right there. 
I like to coon hunt. I've got hounds. And several years ago, my son and I was watching a ball game one Saturday. I told my wife, I said, when it gets halftime, we're going to go cut the dogs loose. We're going to make a tree and we'll be back before the end of the third quarter. We loaded up the dogs. We went down to where we were going to hunt, cut them loose. They got in their little ways. One of them opened up and said, oh, oh. I told my boy, I said, all right, they about to lock in and they're going to put one up a tree. We're going to make the rest of the ball game. No sooner than that old dog opened up and started trailing, it blew in a thunderstorm out of this world. I mean, lightning, thunder, rain coming in sideways. I looked at my son. I said, I, I'm going to take you to the house and I'm going to come back. Now, I'm not afraid of this storm, but your mama makes me nervous sometimes. So I'm going to go and take you home, get you in the house. I came back. That storm had blown over. Not a sound in the woods. Tracking system wouldn't pick them up. Gone. That was on a Saturday. I looked for them dogs all night Saturday night. Till the sun came up Sunday morning. I went to church that morning, preached one of the best messages you've ever heard on depression that Sunday morning. <laughs> looked for them Sunday afternoon, looked for them Sunday night, looked for them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all night, riding them roads, hollering for those hounds. About Friday, my wife said, either you find those dogs or get some new ones or you're going to go missing too, okay? Let's fix this. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday night, went to church the following Sunday, turned that message on depression into a two-part series the next Sunday. <laughs> Preached Sunday night. I stepped out of our little church out in the country. I stepped out on the front porch at the close of the evening service. They were praying inside, dismissing. I stepped out, getting ready to shake hands, and off in the distance, oh, oh, oh. I went in and got one of my men. I said, hey, I said, come here and tell me what you hear, because I hear a hound. But I'm not a real good judge of that right now because I'm hearing hounds in Walmart, Dollar General, the shower in my sleep, so I don't really, I shouldn't be the one to say what this is. I said, what do you hear? He said, preacher, that's a, that's a, that's a hound. I jumped in that truck and I took off down the dirt road up on Gray Rock, went down turned on Highway 27, took another right on Woolridge Road, threw that truck in neutral, turned it off, rolled the windows down, and I'd hear him a little bit louder. Oh, oh, oh. Took off about another half mile down, threw it in neutral, window down, and I'd hear him off down in that holler. I was dressed like I am right now. I climbed out of that truck. It was cold. It was wet. It had been raining, that old wintry weather like we're having this morning. Preacher, I headed off down in them woods and down in that swamp bottom, I could hear that old male dog barking, ow, ow. Now, normally that means, Daddy, there's a coon in here. But on this particular occasion, it meant, Daddy, I'm starving to death. Come and get me. I walked down in that swamp bottom. A little female dog was so weak, she couldn't even stand up. She just laid at the foot of a tree and that old male dog was just, he just walking in circles in there barking. Suit, tie, white shirt. I walked down in that swamp, took my belt off and run it through his collar. Walked over to that little female, scooped her up, muddy, soaking wet against my white shirt, tie, and suit jacket, walking out of them woods. I got almost to the truck and I felt the Holy Ghost of God in my heart say, look at you. Look at you out here day and night looking for yours. 
We're going to shout over a coon dog this morning. You just might as well come to terms with that. <laughs> Losing sleep. Running yourself ragged. Worried sick. Over a hound. And I felt the Holy Ghost in my heart say, if you love those hounds that much, how much more do I love my sheep? <laughs> The psalmist was saying, I'm so messed up. I'm so turned around. I've lost my way so bad that I don't know how to get back to where I'm supposed to be. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to sit down right here and I cannot get to him. But if I bye, bye, Bye. That's pretty good. Y'all know what it is. Bye. <laughs> if I'll just sit and call on him. Yes. Woo. Yes. If I'll just sit and call on him. Yes. He'll come looking for me. <laughs> you know what would be a good way to start revival this morning? And I don't know how y'all do. I just know how we do. You know what would be a good way to start revival this morning? <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. Amen. That'd be a good way to start revival this morning. It's people who's been busy in his word and in his work would just come get on their face before the Lord and say, bye. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. And I sure don't know how to get back. But I do know this. He'll put the 90 and 9 in the fold. And he'll come looking for that one. Amen. Seek thy servant. Stand with me all over the building. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this building. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. They come to get ready for invitation to play and sing. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this building. How many saved folk would say, I'm going to be real honest. I've gone astray. You may not be living in no deep, wicked sin, but you're not as close to him as you once were. That fire is not burning as hot as it once did. Would you throw a hand up and say, I'll be honest, preacher. I have gone astray but I want to be back where he is. Can I see those hands? I see some in every section. Throw it up and let him see it. Many are already on the altar. You can put them down. I wonder if we'd come find a place today and just call on him. Where's your worship? Where's your heart? Where's your giving? Where's your witness? It's so easy to look up and realize we're not where we ought to be. But good news He's looking for you. He'll fix it. He'll come restore you. You just call out on him. They're going to sing while they're singing. Hands that were raised ought to have feet attached that are moving. Would you come? Would you come?